passage comes to us this morning from the eighth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, the first 21 verses, Mark 8, 1 through 21. Please give your undivided attention to God's holy, inerrant, and his infallible word. In those days when, a great, when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? They said seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Domatra. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed heavily, sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side, verse 14. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, Twelve. And the seven of the four thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, Seven. And he said to them, Do you not yet understand? This is the very word of our Lord here this morning. Please take your seats. If this is your first time joining us for worship, we're glad that you're here. We are going through a series in the Gospel of Mark, and we are coming here this morning to the midpoint of the Gospel in chapter 8. The midpoint or the climax of the Gospel of Mark in chapter 8 will be upon the confession of Peter in verse 29. We're not going to get there today, but in the next coming weeks, we'll get to that climax. And if you notice, and if you've been here with us as we have studied the Gospel of Mark, you'll realize that up until this point, you may have noticed that the disciples are in some sense slow. They're slow to get it. They're slow in understanding what exactly is going on and the significance of Jesus' power, his teaching, his works. They're slow to get it. Even at the conclusion of chapter 7, verse 37, we see that the people declare, in some sense, get it better than Jesus. They say, he makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. So it's ironic that the disciples who spend the most time with Jesus still cannot hear nor speak properly about the person and work of Christ. They need, in other words, divine intervention. They don't understand. They don't get it. They need the grace of Jesus to open their eyes and unplug their ears and to be with their tongues and their lips as they speak the very words of Christ himself. And it's throughout all the Gospel of Mark, you'll see even up until this point that Jesus poses these questions to make that point. In chapter 4, verse 13, he says, do you not understand this parable? In chapter 6, 52, we see that Mark writes, they did not understand about the loaves. And at the conclusion of our passage here this morning in chapter 8, verse 17, he says, do you not yet perceive or understand? In the very last verse, verse 21, do you not yet understand? The disciples are slow to get it if you haven't realized it at this point. They need divine intervention. And one of the main points in today's passage is that when you look at the disciples, the readers and the people here this morning are drawn in into the passage. You are drawn in and compelled to see yourself in them, in the disciples. In other words, the disciples represent us. 
The disciples represent you and me. We see ourselves in them. When we look at the disciples, we are to see ourselves in a mirror, that we also are slow to get it. Jesus' frustration and questions are ultimately posed to everyone here this morning. Do you not yet understand? Do you not yet perceive? In other words, New Life Church, are you getting it? Do you see but not perceive? Do you hear but not understand? Have you ever wondered why in worship from the preaching or the teaching of the Word of God or perhaps your own reading of the Bible that you never really seem to receive or respond or experience what other people seem to describe? You know, the conviction that other people seem to talk about, the joy and the insight, this joy that they receive from understanding God better. Have you ever wondered why you never really experience that or respond in that way? If that's you this morning, the passage speaks to that. It means that you may be blind or deaf to some degree, and you need divine intervention. Jesus calls to approach him with a certain demeanor and in a certain way so that we can receive this divine intervention. Chapter 8 if you read through it, it has a plethora of discourses and miracles seemingly unrelated, but there's an overall point here. Mark is intentional. We could take each section as a separate sermon, but rather I could take a, a, a bird's eye view of the passage. We're going to fly over verses 1 to 21 to get a bird's eye view. You know, if you've ever flown over the Grand Canyon, it's a pretty majestic sight, isn't it? That you get a perspective from the airplane 30,000 feet above the Grand Canyon that you necessarily wouldn't have if you're standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon. Because if you're standing on the edge, you also get a majestic sight, but it's a different perspective from that of the airplane flying 30,000 feet over the Grand Canyon. So this morning, we're going to fly 30,000 feet over verses 1 to 21. We're not going to go into the, di- the nitty-gritty of every verse, but we're going to fly over to get this perspective on this passage. And so when we do this, there's three points that we're going to look at. First, we're going to look at Jesus feeding 4,000 in verses 1 to 10. It's really, the point is, approach Jesus with humility. And secondly, we're going to look at the demand of the Pharisees in verses 11 and 13, which is saying, these are the people that approach Jesus with arrogance. And lastly, we'll look at the leaven of the Pharisees in verses 14 to 21, which highlight or point to our needs of divine intervention. So that's where we're going. So buckle your seatbelts. This is where the Lord and His Spirit is taking us here this morning. So point one, Jesus feeding the 4,000, approaching Jesus with humility, verses 1 to 10. When you read verses 1 to 10, it may seem that we've already seen this. If you're experiencing a sense of deja vu, you're probably more right than wrong. In some sense, you're right because Jesus has already fed a multitude. He fed 5,000 in chapter 6, but even more so, you'll realize if you're careful and if you study these passages that there are a sequence of events that are repeated in these chapters. In other words, there are events in chapters 6 and 7 that are repeated in the same sequence in chapter 8. There's a feeding of multitude, chapter 6 and chapter 8. There's a crossing of a sea in chapter 6 and chapter 8. There then is a conflict with the Pharisees in chapter 7 and chapter 8. There's a conversation about bread, a healing, And all this culminates in a confession, both in chapter 7 and chapter 8. And the point and the reason for this is Mark is saying that Jesus thought it necessary to repeat the events and teaching in order to impress upon the disciples the significance of who Jesus is. Do you get it? He's repeating this lesson. It's almost as if he's a teacher. He's reviewing the lesson. He's repeating this sequence of events. He wants to make sure the disciples get it. He heals the deaf and the blind to show that the disciples need to have their ears unplugged and their eyes opened. They need another lesson. And all this is to prepare and lead up to the confession of Peter that Jesus is the Christ. You see how slow they are to get it? It takes them eight chapters to finally get it. Jesus is the Christ. And that's why there's a repetition of events from chapter 6 and 7 to chapter 8. Now, some critical scholars, they say, and I have to address this, that the feeding of the 4,000 is essentially the same historical count of the 5,000. They say it's the same event, so Mark is really just doubling the event. And we have to admit, there are strong similarities. You know, that's a, a good point. Jesus looks at the crowds, and he has compassion. The wording is very similar. He also asks the same question, how many loaves do you have? And so actually, the main argument is really, how can the disciples have forgotten? Jesus, in feeding the 4,000, sees, sees compassion, has compassion for the people. 
The disciples say, how are we going to feed them with the bread that we have? Scholars and critical scholars say, how in the world would disciples forget the first feeding? Why would they ask Jesus, how are we going to feed them when they've already seen the answer back in chapter 6? And that's a good point, and we'll get to that. But nevertheless, these are two different historical accounts. There are similarities, but there are differences that outweigh the similarities. One feeding had five loaves and two fish. The second had seven loaves and small fish. The word for fish here is even different. In chapter 8, the fish, the word for fish is more like a sardine in today's passage. The numbers were also different. 5,000 and 4,000 people were fed. In the first feeding, the crowds were with Jesus for one day. In the second feeding, the crowds were with Jesus for three days. The amount of leftovers was different as well, and the word for basket is different in both accounts. In the first account, the basket is really smaller, somewhat like a gift basket. In today's passage, the word for basket is stronger. It's a basket that could carry a man. It's probably the basket in which the lame man was drawn down into the house. And so the differences surely mark that this is two historical separate accounts. But probably where you'd see the most significant difference is in the geography and location of the two different feedings. In verse 1 of today's passage, it says, in those days. Now, when you see that phrase, in those days, it means that this feeding of the 4,000 connects it with the preceding one in which Jesus is ministering to the Gentiles in Decapolis. Jesus, you see, he's not just ministering to the Jews, but he's also ministering to a multi-ethnic Gentile crowd. Mark's point is essentially this. He's telling us that Jesus is not simply the savior of Israel, but Jesus, as he reaches out to the 4,000 of the Gentile multi-ethnic crowd, Jesus is the savior of the world. He's telling us that anyone can come to Jesus. Jesus will receive anyone, irrespective of your ethnicity and your background. Any one of you here this morning can come to Jesus. He'll receive you. He'll reach out and have compassion on everyone here this morning. And in verse 2, it tells us that Jesus yet again has compassion on the crowd. He's been teaching them for three days, and then he has compassion on them. The word compassion here means literally moved deeply in the seat of his emotions. It has a reference to one's organs or entrails, the heart, the lungs, the liver, and the kidneys. That's how deeply Jesus was moved to the core of his being. He had compassion on the crowds with all that he had, in other words. He had compassion upon the crowds from the very core of his gut. That is the way Mark describes it, from his entrails, in his heart, his lungs. That's how deeply moved Jesus was in his compassion for the people. It's very different for us, isn't it? When we look around at people in need and those who are socially marginalized, there are hearts that receive and respond to those people. It's very different from Jesus, isn't it? We don't necessarily have compassion. We oftentimes really just help people out of a sense of guilt. Or maybe it's just a sense to make ourselves feel better. You know, we've done our Christian duty. We've, we've, we've given some change to the poor person who's homeless and is in need of food. We feel better about ourselves. We've done our Christian duty. You know, back in New Jersey, when I was working in New York, there was such a contrast between socioeconomic classes. You could walk down Park Avenue, and then you'll see these immaculate houses and these penthouses on Park Avenue, but in the next block, you'll see somebody that's just panhandling for food. And over and over again, I reach out, and people tell me, and they reach out to me, and they say, you know, I, I walk, and I see such a contrast, and it just makes me feel really bad. And I feel guilty that I could go to my job, and there's this penthouse, but there's someone who's in need of food, so I give them some money out of my guilt. Or even some people just do it because they want to make themselves feel better. No, this is my Christian duty. Here, let me do my duty. Let me see you as an object, and then I'll help you out. You know, I, I'm really pretty much the same. Even yesterday, if you didn't know, when I usually have work to finish up for church on Saturdays, I go to State College and I go to Panera and I just do my work there. So I had to finish some work there and immediately after I ordered my coffee, I was sitting down and there was a, a woman who couldn't speak English too well. She was strolling, using a stroller with her baby in there and she had a sign that said, no husband, no food. And I was wondering at that moment, I was getting nervous. I was like, what should I do? And I was holding a Bible and I was wondering if people were looking at me. And I'm sure they don't know I'm a pastor, but still they could recognize the Bible. And so maybe I should do it just in case I just defame Jesus' name. And so I, I looked around real quickly to see if everyone was looking at me. No one was looking at me uh, as usual. So I put the Bible down and, and I said, no, I'm, I'm sorry, what, what exactly do you need? Do you need food? He's like, no, I need, I need pampers. I need, I need diapers for my baby. And I said, uh, I'm not sure if we could buy any pampers here at Panera or uh, these other stores. But 
if I give you $5, you promise me that you're going to get Pampers for your baby. And she says, I promise, I promise before God I'll, I'll do it. So I get $5 and I give it to her. And it's almost like a sense of justice kind of comes in. I don't want to be taken advantage of. I said, you promise me you're going to get Pampers with this $5. And she says, I promise. I was like, okay, here it is. Go get your diapers, even though $5 won't even buy that many diapers. See, maybe many of you could resonate and relate to that. That when you look at the people of this world, it's not necessarily a love or compassion that drives you. It's a sense of guilt. I mean, it's a sense of righteousness or justice. Maybe it's a sense of just feeling better about yourself. But that's not how Jesus does it. He's moved by compassion. And his compassion here expresses itself in the details of the people's lives. Do you see the logic and the thought process here of Jesus Christ? In verse 3 it says, If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. Do you see Jesus' concern here? Jesus, it's wonderful. Jesus is intensely practical. He's concerned about the everyday life and everyday considerations and the practicalities of life. They have come from far away. He's saying, if I send them back now, they will faint because they have no food. That's how concerned Jesus is. That's how Jesus' compassion expresses itself for the daily practical matters of your life. See, you may have not noticed this, but there's a subtle difference here in the role of the disciples in Jesus in the feeding of the 5,000 when compared to the 4,000. See, in the second feeding, Jesus has a more prominent role. He directs rather than responds to events. The disciples have a lesser role. They're more responsive and take less initiation in the second feeding. And also, Jesus here is referred to in the first person, whereas in chapter 6, he's referred to in the third person. Verse 2 of chapter 8, Jesus says, I have compassion on the crowds. In chapter 6, verse 34, Mark writes, he had compassion. See, that change in personal pronoun is significant. It's basically saying Jesus has a more direct relationship and heart for the people. It personalizes Jesus to the readers. Jesus' compassion, in other words, is for you. I have compassion on you. I care about the details and matters of your life. I care about the practicalities of your life. That's what Mark is trying to say here. In the same way that Jesus cares about the 4,000 fainting, he cares about your everyday life. He has compassion that explains this. How can we feed the people, the disciples ask in verse 4. Can you imagine this a second time? How can you feed the people with the bread we have in verse 4? You have compassion, Jesus. How will you express that? See, the point is this. It's not that the disciples necessarily forgot. You know, you ever go to somebody who's very gracious, you know, they always pay for your dinner, for your meals, you know, I experience that because, you know, people here are just very generous, and then they want to buy me a meal because I'm the pastor, but I feel a little bit bad about that, so I never want to presume every time I eat someone, hey, are you going to pay for my dinner? I'm not going to presume for that, I'm just going to try to pay for it, I don't want to be, I don't want to be like that. And so the disciples, it may be something along those lines, they saw Jesus perform this miracle, but they don't want to be presumptuous, are you going to feed the 4,000 again miraculously? It's really the sense in verse 4 is, Jesus, what do you tend to do now? You have compassion, what do you intend to do? And Jesus responds with a question. He puts it back on the disciples. How many loaves do you have? See, let me try to draw this out a little bit. It's the same question back in chapter 6. Jesus is teaching the same lesson again to the disciples who are slow to hear and slow to perceive. But he's also, in some sense, he's signaling to them what, is he about, what he's about to do to address the hungry. It's a signal. You know how words and phrases sometimes just permeate our thoughts and our thinking? When we hear a certain phrase, we know what's about to come, don't we? You know, for you children out there, have you ever seen Toy Story? And, you know, one of the most famous characters and catchphrases was Buzz Lightyear. And you know his famous saying, to infinity and beyond. Well, you know what's going to happen. He's going to do something miraculous. He's going to fly and he's going to do something heroic to infinity and beyond. Everyone knows what's about to happen at that moment. That's the sort of sense that Jesus is giving in verse 5. What do you tend to do, the disciples ask. Jesus responds in his own way to infinity and beyond. In other words, how many loaves do you have? See? The disciples are probably looking at them. See? He's going to do it again. (laughs) 
His power is going to come out again. He's going to do it again. Here we go. Watch out. We get to participate this again. He's going to heal, and he's going to fix, and he's going to feed the 4,000. We get to witness this miracle once again. He's signaling it to us. How many loaves do you have? It's miraculous. The disciples understand what's going on. They know what Jesus is about, and that's exactly what he does. He feeds the 4,000 in verse 8, and the people once again were satisfied. Jesus personally wants to satisfy you here this morning with himself. He has compassion for you, for the details and practicalities of your life. Brothers and sisters, Jesus sees where you are. Do you understand that? He understands your insecurities, your physical conditions, the losses in your family, difficulty in marriage, struggles with parenting, financial anxiety, looking for a job. He understands that you're not satisfied with the things of this world. And Jesus sees, and he has compassion. It's personal. I have compassion on you, he says, New Life Church. And he's saying, I understand where you're at, but don't worry. You, you'll, be, you, you'll be okay. You'll be all right. That's what Jesus is saying to us here this morning. He sees you where you are. In the same way that he saw the 4,000, they were accepted and they were loved and they were fed. And this stands in stark contrast to how Jesus interacts in response to the Pharisees, point two, in verses 11 to 13, the demand of the Pharisees. It was very different approaching Jesus with arrogance. We know from the outset that the heart and the intention of the Pharisees is given to us in verse 11. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking a sign from heaven to test him. They came to argue and to test. They had an agenda. In reality, the words in verse 11, they're very strong and antagonistic. The word came means came out in a military sense. The word argue means to attempt to gain control. Test means to not necessarily evaluate as much as to discredit. That's the agenda of the Pharisees. They had a purpose, and we all know that it's not just the way you say something or how or the way that you or what the question that you pose but what matters just as much is how you say it and how you pose the question. The Pharisees are asking a question, but you know that they're not really seeking to learn. They're not coming with a humble heart, acknowledging their need for Christ. They're coming to discredit and, dis and to control Christ. In response, what does Jesus do? He sighs deeply in his spirit and refuses to give them a sign. Why? Why doesn't he help them? It's because the sigh is not one of anger or frustration. It's a sigh of dismay and despair. It's used to describe people who are pushed to their limits. It expresses Jesus' dismay and disgust in dealing with the rebellious and recalcitrant Pharisees. Jesus refused to give them a sign because he knows it won't do any good. I once went on a short-term missions trip to Venezuela, and one of the college students, he was a leader uh, of the group. He was extremely bright. Um, went to Cornell and all that. He was extremely smart. And when I had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with him, he says, I struggle with my faith because I just don't know if I could believe in some of what the Bible says. And I honestly believe if I saw like something similar to the Red Sea parting or some sort of miracle, you know, I, I think I would believe a little bit more. I think that would help me to really believe in Jesus. To which I responded to this brother and I said, miracles will not build your faith. You look at the miracles in the Bible, oftentimes it hardened the hearts of the people. It actually caused greater unbelief. And you need to look at the cross and the gospel and to look who Jesus really is, because miracles aren't really the way. And Jesus is saying essentially the same thing. I'm not going to give you a sign. I've already showed you everything that I've done. I've already taught you everything that I had to teach. You've heard all that I've already taught. If you don't believe and accept me now, then I have nothing left to show you. A miracle will not help you, it will only harden you. You're left on your own, is what Jesus says to the Pharisees. Now, it doesn't sound very loving or Christian, doesn't it? But you see, Mark is making a point about how we are to approach Jesus here. Jesus, he'll accept anyone. He'll accept you. He won't turn anyone away. He wants you to approach him, though, with humility of heart, recognizing your need. See, there's such a stark contrast between the compassion of Jesus with the 4,000 and the discouragement and frustration of Jesus with the Pharisees. That's really the contrast that is set up. In other words, what Mark seems to be saying is this. Divine compassion comes to those with humility of heart and recognition of their need, and divine disappointment 
and frustration come to those who are of arrogance and have a heart with an agenda. Do you see this? Divine compassion may come to those who have a humble heart, divine frustration to those who have an arrogant, an arrogant heart. You know, they say that if you come to the Bible with the agenda, with a critical, arrogant heart, and you look hard enough in the Bible, you'll eventually find what you're looking for. You'll eventually see what you already are looking for. That's why if you have a feminist worldview, you ultimately come away with the conclusion that Jesus is a sh male chauvinist. If you come with a racial worldview, then you ultimately will come away and say Jesus is a racist. If you have a skeptical heart, you look hard enough in the Bible and you'll come to the conclusion Jesus is hypocritical, he's a liar, he's inconsistent. And so this morning, if you come to church with an agenda, with an arrogant heart, don't be too surprised that you find what you're looking for. Even if what you are looking for is really nothing, and you're not expecting anything from Jesus. But if you come this morning with a humble heart, a heart that acknowledges your need and that you're seeking to really understand and test Jesus' claims and to really figure out who Jesus is, then a whole new way in world will be open up to you. A, a whole new power and grace will be given to you. Jesus will accept anyone. He'll receive anyone. He'll open your eyes and unplug your ears. But you need divine intervention in his grace that will saturate a humble heart. And that leads us to lastly to point three in verses 14 to 21, our need for divine intervention. In these verses, we see perhaps the most heightened fashion, the slowness and the obstinacy of the disciples. After all the time they had spent with Jesus, after all they heard from Jesus personally, after all this, all the miracles that they had seen Jesus perform, here they are, the disciples in the boat, having forgotten to bring bread and therefore are having a discussion of what to do. Jesus, upon hearing them, he begins to rebuke them with a series of questions. It's almost as if Jesus had it. Starting in verse 17, he begins, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? In other words, didn't you just see what I have just performed? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? How many baskets did you take up? Do you not yet understand? Jesus is trying to rebuke them. He's making a point. How many times do I have to do this? I've given you several lessons on bread, and you're still not really getting it. You know, in my junior year in high school, I was taking AP chemistry, and my dad, he, he taught chemistry at the collegiate level, so he would always tutor me. It's probably the most traumatic events of my childhood. <laughs> and he would always do it while he's eating dinner. <laughs> I was trying to figure out these stoichiometric problems. I couldn't figure it out. My dad, he would never give me the answer and explain it. He would always lead me to figure it out myself. He thought pedagogically that's the better way to do it. And the whole time, I'm like, I don't understand. I, I can't do it. And I just sit there in silence. And my dad would just be perplexed and says, do you not understand? <laughs> Don't you get it? I've showed this to you already. You're not, you're not understanding. You're not getting it. How can you not understand this problem? I've, I've shown it to you already. And Jesus, in some sense, that's what he's doing here. He's given them several lessons already on bread. Are you still not getting it? Do you still not yet see? Do you still not hear or understand? You see, Jesus has cautioned them to be careful in verse 15. He says, watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Leaven was just a metaphor for corruption, for sin, for unbelief. And Jesus is saying, don't be like the Pharisees. Watch out. I'm beginning to see sin and unbelief creep into the disciples. I see the unbelief battling and settling in. Be careful here, Jesus says, watch out. Because a little leaven, a little unbelief can have a huge impact is what he's saying. In other words, a little unbelief, a little corruption, a little sin can have catastrophic events. So if you doubt a little bit here this morning, Jesus is saying, watch out. If there's something that you don't really believe, struggle with it, wrestle with it. If you don't believe a little bit, if you don't, if you don't address a little bit of your sin, Jesus is saying, watch out. A little leaven can corrupt the whole. And Jesus is seeing this happen before his very eyes. The disciples seem to be regressing. They're not getting it. They're not understanding. See, it's astounding for Jesus. It's amazing. It's almost unbelievable for us here this morning. The disciples seem to be so slow and dull. No, their hearts are so hardened. They seem quite honestly 
stupid. They're stupid. That's how, I know that sounds mean and ungracious and harsh, but they're slow. They're, they're stupid. They're not, they're not getting it. But you know what's so truly amazing about this passage? You know what's so, so miraculous about these stupid disciples? It's because when you look here at these verses and at these disciples, when you look at this passage, it draws us into the disciples. If you really take a second and you step back, the real truth and amazement of this passage is to see yourself in the disciples. And you think, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, do you see your face in these verses? Do you hear your voice in these verses? Do you see your heart in these verses? Can you hear Jesus' voice speaking to you? Will, you're not getting it still. Will, you're not seeing it. Will, do you not yet understand? Do you not yet perceive? Do you not yet hear? That's the point of the passage, that all of us see ourselves here, that we are slow, and we are in need of his grace and divine intervention to open our eyes and our ears. If you are not a believer here this morning, I say this lovingly, but I have to say this, you are blind and you are deaf. If you not embrace Jesus with all your heart and you're stagnant in your walk with the Lord, you are blind and you are deaf. All of us are really in that same boat. And you may be thinking, understand what? What am I supposed to understand? Understand that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he is Lord over your life, that he is the Messiah and the King. See, in verse 14, Mark tells us that the disciples forgot to bring bread. And verse 14 tells us they only have one loaf in the boat. See, some commentators are pretty clever. They say this one loaf actually refers to Jesus, the bread of life. Now, I think that's clever, but probably not the actual intention, but nonetheless, the point is the same. Jesus is Lord over your life. He is the bread of your life. He's the only one that can truly and fully satisfy you in the long run. He's the one who has compassion on you and cares about the details and practicalities of your life. Is setting up the stage, in other words, for Jesus' or Peter's confession of Jesus. Who do you say that I am? He wants everyone in this room to answer that question. Who do you say that I am? And he prays, and I pray that everyone would respond, not only in their talk, but also in their heart, as well as their actions. Jesus is the Christ. You are the Christ. That is what the passage wants us to get away with this. And I leave you with simple questions. Do you see him in this manner? Are you deaf and are you blind? Do you hear him? Do you not yet understand? Because I pray that every one of us do. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Father, would you open our eyes by your spirit and the power and truth of your word? Would you unplug our ears to hear the truth of your voice? And Lord, would you soften our hearts to be teachable and receptive. Oh Lord, you are the Christ, you are the chosen one, the one who has taken upon our sin and brought redemption and salvation and kingdom power into this world and our lives. Lord, we thank you that you saw us and have compassion upon us in the daily nitty gritty practicalities of our lives. And so Lord, I pray that you just fill our hearts with your spirit, that we are united to you, and that you'd help us to see you for who you really are, Lord. Help us, Lord, to understand, help us to perceive, and help us to hear. We pray all these things in the person and work of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. At this time, let us now respond to the preaching of his word and his grace by standing as one people and responding with a song of thanksgiving as the deacons will go around to collect the tithes and offerings. <clears throat>
help us grasp the heights of your plans for us. Truth unchanged from the dawn of time that will let go down through eternity. And thy grace will stand on your promises. But by faith we'll walk as you walk with us. Speak, O Lord, till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. My grace will stand by your promises. And by faith we'll walk as you walk with us. Speak, O Lord, and your church is built, and the earth is filled with your glory. Let us now sing the doxology for the presentation of our tithes and offerings. Let us now receive the benediction of our Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit.